The world has moved on and time has grown strange. Car's a real duck. Car? What does car mean? It means you're playing someone who's going to destroy you. All things serve the bee. Tell the man in black I say hello. The world as Roland had always known it would be swept away. It starts here. From its field of roses, the dark tower cries out in its beast's voice. Time is a face on the water. Hello and welcome to Tower Junkies, presented by ObsessiveViewer.com. Tower Junkies is a podcast celebrating the work of Stephen King, hosted by two lifelong constant readers. We do non-spoiler and spoiler reviews of King's published work and take a critical look at his film and television adaptations as well. We also discuss the latest King news and check in with each other on our ongoing King obsessions. Uh, it's the podcast where all things serve the king. Uh, you can find more of our work at TowerJunkiesPod.com. You can also like the Facebook page at Facebook.com slash TowerJunkiesPod and follow us on Twitter and every other level of social media at TowerJunkiesPod. And if you'd like to support what we do here and get exclusive bonus content, uh, both about Stephen King and about any, like any and everything related to film and television and media in general, you can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. There are hundreds and hundreds of episodes on there that is ex- exclusive for Patreon. I do have a special tier for Stephen King related content. So if you just want Stephen King uh, related content, such as uh, uh, what I call the Church of King, where every Sunday I do a breakdown of uh, Stephen King something. So like currently right now I'm doing weekly installments of, uh, review read along reviews of all things Holly Gibney. So I've reviewed, uh, Mr. Mercedes in three parts, uh, finders keepers in three parts. I'm currently on end of watch, which is going to be four parts. And then after that, I'm going to do the outsider in four parts. And then, uh, if it bleeds, and then after that, we're going to go into Holly, uh, once it comes out in September. So, um, that plus a whole bunch of other stuff, check out, uh, patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. Um, yeah, uh, I'm one of your hosts, Matt Hurt. And today on the show, we're, we're going to be continuing our podcast journey to the dark tower with a look at the gunslinger chapter three titled the Oracle in the mountains. Uh, and joining me to do that, of course, is tiny, tiny. How are you doing this evening? I am doing great, man. Thanks for nice. asking. How you doing? I'm doing quite well. Uh, I we so we did a B roll episode for Patreon that isn't related to the Dark Tower, uh, as we usually have been doing it with this. But uh, we just kind of got on a bunch of different tangents and topics. So uh, that was really fun. And also, uh, of all of the things that like we talked about in that in that B roll episode. Uh, one thing I didn't mention was that we, and we don't need to harp on it or anything, but, um, on June 15th, we celebrated 10 years since the day that we recorded our first podcast, uh, which is nuts. It's crazy. It's awesome. Um, and then today, June 21st is the 10 year anniversary of when that podcast episode was published. Uh, so kind of neat. So how do you feel about that, Tiny? That is amazing. I mean, that's basically a third of our lives at this point, right? damn near, that we've been doing this. It's crazy to think about, man. It I, really some, is. Sometimes sometimes it only feels like it's been like three or four years that we've been doing this, you know? Oh, it's it really, yeah. Yeah, it does. Wild. Yeah. It's, it's like, I think, I think Mike kind of said this at one point, but um, like years ago, but like this is... This thing that we do, just podcasting in general, is like, it is the most time I, and I'm sure you, have spent doing something, like, in general. Like, like you said, we've spent, at this point, almost a third of our lives. We, like, we, in terms of, like, I don't know, this, this is weird, uh, like, because it's also it doesn't really equal uh, out or anything, but like we, like we've spent a third of our lives podcasting and a third of our lives sleeping, 
<laughs> like mm. it's just it, that's weird. Um, I don't know if that translates, but but yeah, I did not think of that. That is interesting. <laughs> I'm trying to think of like another activity, mm. other like another voluntary activity. Yeah. Um, that I've done more than this, and especially in terms of I, a like creative or uh, hobby thing, I guess. Creative or hobby? Yeah, nothing comes yeah. close. Um. Other than like plowing chicks and stuff. <laughs> um, Jesus. <laughs> no, but like, no, like uh, no, nothing, nothing at all. None of the sports I played. Right. Um, I mean, school was not voluntary, so. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. I, Even I, when it I, was I voluntary. Yeah. Like when, like college and everything, like, yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, that's bananas to think yeah. of it in that context. Yeah, that's wild. Yeah, it is very wild and crazy and weird. <laughs> Did but, you? Yeah. I know someone when you posted about this on social media. I know someone asked about like, um, like actual <laughs> hours and minutes and stuff. Yeah. Have you have you compiled that yet? I haven't compiled that yet. I really need to because I I'm very interested in that. Yeah. Obviously, just by the nature of who I am as a person. Um, the problem is, is there even a is there even a reasonable way to get that information? Oh, well? it's oh, actually probably a better. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I, I, I've got this, Tiny. I've got this. Um... <laughs> I know, I know you can do it, but I'm saying, could a normal person uh, in a reasonable way compile that information? Yeah, honestly, yeah, yeah. So, like my okay. my process is that I just need to take the archive of everything that we've done and plug it into like VLC media player, just a media player on on my laptop. And then that has like at the top, like the comp- compiling, like the amount of time that is in that whole playlist. So the problem also is that I need to update the archive, which just means pulling from the RSS feed um, and downloading each episode, which I, I do yeah. that frequently just to have, you know, an, a backup of everything. Um, but I haven't done that in a while, so yeah. So yeah, Dang, okay. So that so those stats are coming. Nuts. Oh no no no, it's okay. not it's not tedious at all. It's the problem is that because I am who I am, I'll I'll be like okay, so this is how much we have of of obsessive viewer. This is how much we have of anthology. This is how much we have of tower junkies. This is how much we have of this specific type of Patreon content. This specific type of Patreon content and. <laughs> For those, this is not a pitch for Patreon, but for those who aren't on Patreon, there's a lot of stuff that I throw. I just posted today for the $10 Patreon tier, a 10, no, 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 not 10, but a a 90 minute um, test recording for a new wireless mic that I picked up as a little like 10 year like anniversary present to myself. Oh my God. And it's like, it is like 30 minutes of me driving to work. 30 minutes of me driving home from work and 20 minutes of me going to get food. And then another like 25 minutes of me, uh, or like 15 minutes of me, uh, on my lunch break at working from home. Um, so, uh, yeah. And it's all just stuff. So, but it's all premium content at the $10 level, (laughs) which if you sign up at the $10 level, you get access to everything on Patreon, which is like, Closing in on uh, 500 individual recordings, um, they vary in length. Some are an hour and a half, some are 15, 30 minutes. Um, but a lot of like TV, book, uh, movie reviews and reactions. I'm working on a um, a big Black Mirror season six reaction recording before I do it for like before I review the episodes proper on anthology. So that's coming. Um, but yeah, but anyway, Patreon, patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. Um, yeah. Yeah. The pa- Patreon feed is probably the most amount of content at this point. Honestly. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. It, <laughs> this isn't my goal, but like ideally it may actually also already be, a thing but um like my hope is that very soon if i haven't already it will in terms of the sheer number of of individual episodes released on patreon will 
will or has already eclipsed the amount of the three podcast uh, shows that we do cumulatively. So, like, Obsessive Viewer is 394 episodes. This is episode 88, technically 89 since we had an episode zero. And then uh, Anthology, I think I'm up to, like, 162. Um, And I don't know, I can't do math that quickly in my brain. Uh, So I don't know what all that is. But on Patreon, it's, like, 489 episodes or probably, like, almost 500 at this point. So, Um, Wow. So a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff yeah wild man yeah it's it's uh it's something oh uh, no it's not something it's just something that you know we love doing i love doing it so uh for sure yeah 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 i've been missing it for the last couple of months so mm. yeah well i'm glad that you're back tiny uh um, me too yeah hell yeah uh so do you want to actually get into our <laughs> our our stephen king podcast <laughs> Let's do it, man. Nice, nice. Okay, so uh, we are going to be talking about uh, the Oracle in the Mountains. Uh, is it mountains or mountain? Mountains. Um, Oracle in the Mountains, which is chapter three of The Gunslinger. It's part of our ongoing you know, coverage of the Dark Tower series. Um, I do have some Stephen King news to go through, if you don't mind, Tiny. I don't have any check-ins. Do you have any check-ins? I don't have any check-ins, no. Okay. Um, well, I technically do have one check-in, but, well, it's kind of wrapped up in news, so it's fine. Um, okay. So, a few news items from uh, the Stephen king Uh This one is from, um, I think, a couple of months ago, uh, but HBO Max, uh, it prequel series, Welcome to Derry, uh, has cast some new people. Um, Taylor Page, uh, Jov- uh, Jovan Adepo from the Stand miniseries, uh, James Remar and Chris Chalk. Um, and I saw like a TikTok where uh, someone was saying that, like someone was um, uh, near where they were filming. So they just took like a TikTok video of like the entire set and everything like they had retrofitted the street with the set. Uh, so very curious about that. Are you, um, are you, how, how do you feel about Welcome to Dairy? This, this kind of it prequel series for Max, formerly HBO Max. I had kind of forgotten about it actually. Um, <laughs> I'm a little hesitant on it just because mm-hmm. I think it's going to, it, it's one of those situations where it has to be done delicately mm-hmm. and like it could fail spectacularly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> If if the right sentiment isn't there, I guess um, I don't know. I feel like even like it, you know, the the adaptations of it are tough to pull off, and it's one of Stephen King's most popular books, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, we'll we'll see. Like, we always kind of yeah. say that, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously, I'm going to watch it, and I'm I'm very curious and kind of excited for it, even. But uh, yeah, mm-hmm. I, I just sort of, I guess, I guess, I kind of have a bad feeling. Okay. But, uh, but uh, yeah, we'll see. You know, that's totally fair. I think I like I'm mildly excited about it and cautiously at that. Um especially since I mean HBO Max has turned into kind of a fickle thing with them pulling a lot of stuff anyway, so who knows how far this will get or anything. But what I am very interested in in this in this respect is that like when it in uh it chapter 2 were coming out like I had just such an intense feeling that it would have been so cool if they did like short films that filled in the gaps of like the backstory of Derry uh, and released it as like promotional content or something. And like this, this TV show is like that idea kind of like expanded. Uh, so I think that that would be an interesting, I think there's a lot of detail that can be mined for it and a lot of space with which they can move around and and tell some unique stories. So I'm cautiously excited. Okay. Right on. Yeah. Um, A couple other news uh, items. Uh, So I'm going to save the uh, certain one for last, but um, there are a couple of things like Stephen King has reviewed a couple of books recently. Um, He caught the ire of, uh, (laughs) 
of that well-renowned quote-unquote news um, person, <laughs> Tucker Carlson, uh, on Tucker's uh, Twitter show uh, since he was fired from Fox News. Um, but he, so King had reviewed, uh, in the reviews on Simon and Schuster.com, um, Hunter Biden's new memoir. And if you know anything about Tucker, Tucker Carlson and, you know, the right wing, they just have such an erection for Hunter Biden, um, a man who's never held office or anything. And so King had written, like, I'll just read the blurb that's on Simon and Schuster, uh, he said, in AA, we say it doesn't matter if you come from Yale or jail, all addicts are the same. In his harrowing and compulsively readable memoir, Hunter Biden proves again that anybody, even the son of a U United States president, can take a ride on the pink horse down Nightmare Alley. There are plenty of memoirs about the three R's, rum, ruin, and redemption, but there are sections in this one that stand out with haunting clarity. Biden remembers it all and tells it all with a bravery that is both heartbreaking and quite gorgeous. He starts with a question, where's Hunter? The answer is he's in this book, the good, the bad, and the beautiful, which is a very nice blurb and everything. And yeah. of course, Tucker Carlson, because he's uh, an, uh, an imbecile, um, <laughs> uh, I think referred to Stephen King and David Eggers um, as brainless or something uh so i don't know it was that it doesn't matter uh but stephen king <laughs> uh had a glowing review for that um so that's neat i didn't even know that there was a book out or coming out um but yeah any Me thoughts either. on that yeah <laughs> uh i i had no idea that uh tucker carlson had um I had a Twitter show. <laughs> that's where he. Yeah. Uh, that's where he landed. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think oh, wow. he also. I I want to say that Fox News like threatened to sue him or something, or threatened some kind of legal action because uh, because of a non compete clause in his contract. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just that I I don't care. I I cannot stand him or fox news it's just it it's moronic absolutely moronic but anyway yeah um right. so uh on a on a lighter note um and and far less controversial note um and this also wraps up into my check-in uh in the new york times king reviewed a uh the new novel by s.a cosby uh who writes i believe he writes uh kind of Southern noir mysteries. Um, his new book, All the Sinners Bleed, got a very glowing review by Stephen King in the New York Times. And uh, because of that, I, I I got the audiobook for All the Sinners Bleed and I finished it a couple of days ago. And man, that book kind of blew me away. I, I loved it. Um, so much so mm -hmm. that I'm very much like, I want to go back and read uh, S.A. Cosby's other novels. Um, their titles are escaping me right now, but they're on my list and everything. But um, but All the Sinners Bleed is about this uh, this sheriff in like a southern county um, named Titus Crown, who is a former FBI agent who comes back to uh, Sharon, Sharon County where he grew up and he runs for, he runs for sheriff and he becomes sheriff. Then one day the son of one of his old, like, like high school friends, uh, goes into the school and kills one of the teachers, uh, before dying in a hail of gunfire by the deputies. Uh, that, that, that kind of, um, uh, springs, is is the springboard for uh this big like conspiracy like like a more heinous crime is uncovered as a result of it and it brings out a lot of like the racial tensions of of the county and the things that like Titus Crown has to deal with and his his past with the FBI and there's it is just such a beautifully and immaculately written mystery thriller um and it is like i like I said on uh, like on Patreon and uh, in my like Goodreads review and everything that I I have no idea if S.A. Cosby 
has any intentions of like making a series out of this or anything. Um, because all of his other novels are standalone novels, but like the strength of the writing of the Titus crown character, the sheriff is, is, is incredible. Like it is fantastic. And I would, I would read like a mountain of books with this guy at the center of it. Um, it was really good. So that's my glowing review of all the centers bleed. <laughs> um, Damn. yeah, that sounds really good. Yeah. Yeah. Highly, highly recommend it. Um, yeah. Okay. So that is, oh, oh, I have one more piece of news, um, that is directly tied to what we cover on this show. Uh, are you ready for the final piece of news, Tiny? Yes, I'm ready. Okay. So the headline is, uh, director Mike Flanagan gives update on the Dark Tower TV show, quote, we're on a great path. Um, so what I'm pulling from the article is that, of course, last December, uh, Flanagan and his, his producing partner, Trevor Macy, um, announced that they're working on an adaptation of the Dark Tower books, uh, which, uh, Flanagan envisions as a five season TV series followed by two standalone features. The quote that he had at one of the quotes he had at the time was, Quote, the pilot script is one of my favorite things I've ever gotten to work on. It's been surreal working on that, so we've been floored and grateful that Stephen King trusts us with such an undertaking, something so precious to him, and we hope to find the right partners to realize it. So recently, like a week or so ago, during a Q&A at the Tribeca Film Festival, uh, I think this may have been last Thursday, uh, he gave an update on his proposed version of the of, of the Dark Tower. Uh, he said, quote, uh, that's the one I want to do the most um, after he was asked uh, to name his dream project. And he continued and he said, I have the rights. We're on strike, but I'm very optimistic that we're on a great path with that. We have good partners. We can't talk about it, but I think it's going to happen. I can't say for certain, but we look good. So I'm hoping that's up there. So I, 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 I hope it happens. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Hopefully we get some news soon. Yes. Oh God. I just, it's. (laughs) Like I went to the pool today after work, so I think, and I'm gonna take a shower after we record. Um, so like my eyes are a little like dry because I think some of the like chlorine and stuff. But also I'm a little teary eyed <laughs> just at the thought that Mike mm. Flanagan can can maybe bring this to life. Um, yeah, for real. Yeah. yeah, he's he's our evanescence. He's bringing it to life. Bring me to life. Uh, (laughs) Wow, that is a dated reference. (laughs) It really is. Um, (laughs) So, yeah. Um, So, yeah. So, Mike, if you're out there, you know, keep keep doing it. Um, (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I'm just, I, yeah, I'm so excited for that. Uh, So, that's all the news and check-ins I have. Any comments on that, Tiny? Or do you want to proceed to our coverage of the Oracle and the Mountains? Uh, it's all very exciting news, but yes. uh, yeah, we should uh, we should get to our own coverage. Yes, hell yes. Okay, so of course we're going to be covering, uh, sharing our thoughts on the Oracle in the Mountains, which is chapter three of the Gunslinger. This is going to be a spoiler discussion for this section and any previous sections. We're not going to spoil anything going forward um, in the story. So it, make sure you read this read this chapter and listen to the review. Um, this, uh, installment, the Oracle in the mountains was published in the magazine of science, uh, of fantasy and science fiction in February, 1981. And before we get to it, I have a previously on the dark tower. Uh, so here we go. After leaving Brown's hut to continue on his quest for the man in black, a severely dehydrated Roland stumbles upon a coach line way station and meets Jake Chambers. Jake is a young boy who clearly doesn't belong in the desert of Roland's world, yet he offers food and water to the gunslinger so Roland can regain his strength. Under hypnosis, Jake tells Roland about his life in New York City that culminated with the man in black pushing him into traffic. Jake's death in New York transported him to Roland's world, which the gunslinger sees as another trap set by the malevolent man in black. With limited provisions and the suspicion that Jake may prove to be a sacrifice he must make down the line, Roland reluctantly agrees to have the boy accompany him on his search. Before embarking on the journey, Roland loots the waystation cellar and encounters an evil spirit with a grave warning. 
Roland takes a jawbone from the cellar, and then he and Jake head toward the mountains. Along the way, Roland remembers his childhood in the land of Gilead, where he became a gunslinger. In the flashback, he and his friend Cuthbert stumble upon a plot by the cook hacks to poison men, women, and children in the name of an enemy who goes by the name the good man John Farson. Roland and Cuthbert watch as Hacks the Cook is publicly hanged for his crimes and takes the lesson to heart. Um... I believe that was from Wikipedia um, because I don't think I wrote that myself. It's been a while. Um, (laughs) So so going on to the Oracle in the Mountains, Chapter 3, the brief synopsis I have of that is uh, Roland and Jake eventually make their way out of the desert. Roland rescues Jake from an encounter with a succubus and tells him to hold on to the jawbone as a protective charm. Roland couples with the succubus, who is also an oracle, to learn more about his fate and the path to the dark tower so tiny chapter three the oracle in the mountains how did you feel about it this time around and uh let's let's get to talking about it yeah um i felt really good about this this was one of the parts of the gunslinger that i'd kind of forgotten about or it Mm -hmm. just wasn't what was like really not fresh in my memory at all um i think what I like about it the most is in chapter two, Roland and Jake are like thrown together mm-hmm. and there's not conflict, but just kind of like they're getting to know each other and there's not any bonding really, mm-hmm. not, not really any bonding yet. And it's so new and yeah. it's like kind of a sense of other knees. Right. Right. Um, and Jake is a literal fish out of water. Uh, well, not literal, but you know what I mean? He's <laughs> he's a fish out of water. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and so what I like about this is the bonding is starting in this, uh, in this chapter. Um, and it's starting to feel more like the quartet that I remember from mm-hmm. all the books, you know? Um, and it's... Uh, I I had kind of forgotten about the whole Oracle thing. I I remembered some of the, some of the parts of it, but um, I, I think that's a fascinating concept of this like mystic ethereal kind of there kind of isn't creature that's just lives in this part of the forest and sustains itself on sexual interaction. Um, That's, that's just like, so strange to me i mean i feel like a lot of times the whole oracle uh oracle concept in in the fan in fantasy stories has sexual undertones or even overtones mm-hmm. to it so like it kind of makes sense um it's not like i don't know if it makes sense but i think i feel like it's on point or on track for the for the the many genres that this story touches mm-hmm. um and so I, I liked reading that. Um, and then I, I love how everything comes to a head in this chapter because we're getting this bonding between Roland and Jake. Jake is getting more comfortable in the world mm-hmm. and this new world. And then a giant wrench gets thrown into it. And it's, yeah. it's so, so, so palpable at the end. I, I, fr- I had completely forgotten how tense and just like palpable that is at the end. Yeah, the and we'll circle back to the end, but I I do want to touch on it here for just just a brief second where that that the combination of Roland like notice like knowing that he's lying to Jake when Jake asks if he's going to be okay or whatever um and and asking Roland like will you protect me and Roland know it like I think the line is something like uh Roland knows the lie on his lips or whatever um says like yeah I'll protect you you'll be fine knowing that he is likely going to be you know sacrificed um and even it it goes even deeper when Roland like there's that moment I can't remember what triggered it but there's that moment where where uh where King writes that this is the moment where where uh the the small thing in front of Roland ceased to be Jake and just and just became the boy. Like that level of just 
disassociating with him as a human being, <laughs> as a life that he is entrusted in, entrusted with, is really, really spectacular writing. And then the third element of that is the man in black, when they see each other in the mountain or on the mountain, um, and the man in black just toys with him and says, like, we'll talk, we'll, like, you and I will... Uh, 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 have, I know the words, but I can't think of them. Um, have long palaver. Um, and then he just like, he throws it out there. He's like, just me and you like, just no, like, just right in front of Jake, just saying like, yeah, you know, you're probably not going to make it buddy. Um, is, is like perfect, like psychological, like warfare <laughs> on his part. Um, right. Yeah. That, that's, that's such a, uh, such a such a great moment in in this chapter um mm -hmm. yeah it's kind of like the climax of the whole chapter um yeah yeah it's really good but we'll we'll circle yeah. back to that and in any thoughts on that um yeah i i agree i mm -hmm. i think that that's yeah well i i think we'll we'll circle back to it there's a there's a yeah. point i wanted to talk about um in regards to it. we'll we'll get we'll get to it later Okay. Okay. So yeah. to kind of go, maybe not point by point or anything, but there's a lot of kind of travel in this, in this section, in this chapter. Um, it kind of begins with Jake and Roland kind of setting up camp and Roland killing a rabbit and then making stew out of it and everything. Um, and there's a sense that Jake is eager to help like get firewood and everything. And Roland's just like, no, no, you, you're, you're good. Um, but then things kind of take a turn with um with uh, an element of the story that king will revisit down the line um but the idea of you know jake being kind of um possessed uh in his sleep and uh being kind of taken control of and everything and as roland is in a, in another case of the book kind of connecting Roland and Jake together um kind of in a metaphysical way um Roland like dreams like he dreams about Susan which is some interesting foreshadowing in the revised edition um and in the dream she warns that like you know Jake's dying and uh that's when Roland has a vision of Jake and he wakes up and finds Jake under the spell and everything so i don't know it, it that is like an interestingly disguised fantasy, just exposition exposition for what's to come with the Oracle and everything. But how'd you feel about that? Like the tension of that and in the way that that first part is kind of written. Yeah, it's, um, I, I, I didn't, I didn't, I may have said this before in, in the first couple episodes where we, we talked about this, but I, I kind of forgot how much like dreaming there is, like how, how many, yeah how much story happens while Roland is asleep mm -hmm. um, or other characters for that matter. Um, but yeah, I, I had just kind of forgotten about that. And it's, it's sort of a, I feel like it's a tactic, uh storytelling tactic that I don't necessarily love. Like I feel, I feel like it's almost easy or a bit of a, it can be a bit of a crutch maybe, especially like on a TV show or something like, Oh, they were yeah. dreaming, you know? Um, and it, it can just be like a little cheap, I guess. Um, and, and I don't love foreshadowing either. I think it's gotta be done the correct way. Mm -hmm. Um, th there's foreshadowing later, um, later in the, uh, uh, this chapter that I like, mm -hmm. I think it's really good. But, uh, but this is like, it's just super on the nose. Jake's dying. Like, and it's, yeah, I, I I don't I don't love it. Like I don't hate it either. I don't think it's bad. It's just I I feel like and maybe this is mean, but I feel like King is better than that, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um you know, like like uh, I was obsessed with um Dan Brown like back in the day like uh yeah. when when he was at his his peak, you know, mm -hmm. with uh Da Vinci Code and all that jazz and he uses foreshadowing as crutch, not not in a good way. Like, <laughs> I, yeah. I'm not, I'm not trying to shit all over Dan Brown. Like I genuinely appreciate his books and still do, but like mm. I, he's not a magnificent writer. And even back then when I was a dumb, dumber teenager, I didn't <laughs> like the foreshadowing and he doesn't do it well. And so anytime yeah. I see my beloved, uh, my beloved Stevie using it, I'm like, eh. and that's the thing. He actually uses it. I don't say he, I don't want to say he uses it a lot, but mm -hmm. I think 
he he relies on it sometimes um and it's totally. it's kind of a it's a recurring thing and i i don't know maybe it's it, that's just kind of um monday morning quarterbacking i guess <laughs> uh for on my part but um no anyways he, he I, definitely I, uses it um yeah he uses I, it kind yeah. of I, I don't know if a lot is the right word or mm. the right phrase, but I, I mean, he frequently uses foreshadowing. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say like he, like to your point, he doesn't like do it as a crutch or anything, but it's not, yeah, right. It's not it a is, crutch. Yeah. But it is, it is, it is pretty much a trope of his writing though. Um, and here it is a little bit on the nose. I'm, I'm curious to go back and read this part. Um, in the original edition, because this is clearly like yeah. something implemented from the revised edition since it's a vision of Susan. I don't know. For all I know, it could be the exact same, like, but it's just um, uh, the alley from uh, from Tull. Um, mm. I feel like that could be the case. But in any case, it is it is kind of a an interesting, interesting moment. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's also interesting that it's stuff that he goes back to later in the series, like not with the same characters or anything, but, um, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, then we get Roland taking mescaline, <laughs> uh, to go to the succubus and then him facing off with the with the succubus so how did you feel about this part of it i i really like the whole mescaline thing because mm-hmm. i i and i think i think it pairs well with um with jake being essentially attacked by the the succubus the oracle um because i feel like while there is obvious obviously a sexual uh, element mm-hmm. to the interactions with the Oracle. It's also a mental thing, right? Like it's not, yeah. it's not just, it's not just physical. Like it's there, there's a mental thing. And, and then like, if the, the Oracle cannot convince you to have sex with it, mm-hmm. uh, she'll take it like this yeah. or the Oracle will take it from you and, and use the weakness of your mind to take it from you. Mm-hmm. And, um, I like how it so easily traps Jake and is going to take it from Jake reg- regardless of whether or not he wants to. Mm-hmm. Um, and then a reaction to that is Roland taking mescaline to, uh, to, um, confront the succubus because mm-hmm. mescaline, you know, it's, it's, it's a hallucinatory drug that works on your mind. And so, mm-hmm. uh, it, 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 it essentially, neutralizes the weapon of that the succubus has over people to yeah. you know control them or convince them of things and it's i i, I just think it's it's cool um and it's uh it's good writing and it's mm-hmm. uh kind of fascinating you know and it's not like psychedelic druggy story stuff it's right. just it there's like a logic to it you know i i kind of uh I just thought it was an interesting thing and you know the mes- mescaline even exists in midworld is kind of cool but uh yeah there's a different name for it and everything, but yeah, I, mm-hmm. I, I really appreciate it for, I appreciate it creatively. Yeah, I, I do too. And I think it's an interesting just step toward like facing off the, facing the succubus. Um, it's just, it's just an interesting piece of detail there. Like, it, and it shows the kind of, uh, strength of mind that Roland has and the planning that he has that it's like, yeah, this is, like this is a tool for him to encounter a being um, to get his answers and everything. And then like after he takes it, like he to prepare for it, um, he starts cleaning his guns and there's just a really quick line where King says like he started the ritual of cleaning his guns. And I just, I'm, I'm so attracted to that type of, of writing and storytelling where it's a character who like everything about him is like, he's a gunslinger. That is his defining characteristic there. Obviously Roland is a very deep character, but his defining characteristic is that he is the last gunslinger. So the fact that he like, I feel like the books never glamorize 
that I say that with an asterisk, but um, glamorize the gunplay or anything because it's always a case of Roland using the tools that he has and the training that he has and the rituals that he has with these almost talismanic objects that can be used to fire projectiles from <laughs> from a chamber. Um, it's just, I just really like that, that level of like expertise in writing where like the character is like, looks like his most prized possessions are the things that he is trained with and, and held for, you know, countless years. So I don't know. There's just something romantic about it, I guess. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it's like a swordsman with his sword or. Yeah. Totally. It's like, it's like a samurai. Like there's Mm -hmm. a uh, spiritual element to it and, you know, mystical, magical element to it. And yeah, I totally, I totally get what you're saying. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Um, so the actual encounter with the succubus, um, he is given a prophecy where she says that, uh, three, like, um, she says that three is three is the magic number. Another number comes later, but for now it's three. Uh, there are three, three people that will lead you to the tower. And then she, uh, I think that this is what you're referring to with the foreshadowing uh, references. Like one is a man who is gripped by uh, a demon called heroin. The other is, um, uh, comes on wheels, uh, and then the third is death, but but not for you. And I love that foreshadowing for characters to come, but also just like the <laughs> the like connective tissue of that, where where the the oracle then says like, um, Jake is your key to the man in black. The man in black is the key. I think the man in black is the key to the three, the three are your key to get to the dark tower. It's just, it's, I don't know. There's like this, this tension and excitement that builds from that, that, that I really like. So how'd you feel about that encounter and everything? Uh, yeah, it's like one of my favorite parts of the chapter. I think it's nice. cool as shit. It's one of my favorite parts of the, this book actually. Um, nice. I, I just think it's cool. I, I love that kind of foreshadowing. Like mm-hmm. I know it's, um, I, I mean, I guess you could call it a trope too, but the the whole again, like the person going to an oracle is mm-hmm. a delicate dance to uh, orchestrate, you know. Um, I, but I I like this one. It seems it feels classic. It feels like um, what is it, Macbeth going to? Is it in Macbeth oh, where he yeah. goes to the to the three witches and mm-hmm. the double bubble boil in trouble? Like yeah. that's. It, honestly, like I'm not trying to say that you know Stephen King is William Shakespeare, but um, I but guess I'm kind of comparing. Let's be real. Kind of comparing. <laughs> right. <laughs> He's kind of Shakespeare. Be <laughs> They'd be buddies. I yeah, mean, no doubt. Um, <laughs> but I guess I, I guess I kind of am. I feel like I feel like it is that that level of creativity where because I mean there's the rhyme that you just rattled off that mm-hmm. feels just like that. It's uh, I don't know. It's it's very the mysticism of it and the um, implications of it and the quality foreshadowing are just uh, like, like vague, but also makes you think, you know, like it's, I I don't know, like obviously we've read it before, so we know what it means, but people who didn't, who were reading this for the first time, like she comes on wheels and (laughs) he's got a a demon called heroin. Like this is wild, you know, I mean, that that one's a little more, you know, uh, uh, easier to uh right figure it out but i'm just saying it's i I just like the way if you look at it from the shoes of of roland he's like i've never heard of the demon heroin yeah it's just kind of a uh i don't know it just it just feels so right Mm -hmm. like i just i really love it it's it's and it's it's false it's also um another horror element i think i think it's like it's it's like I, i feel like fantasy is like intrinsically woven into horror. I feel mm-hmm. like they have to be there. Like they, they have to work together. Like a, a fantasy has to have horror elements to it. And yeah. and this, 
this is some of that, you know, like there's always a, there's always a Sauron who's, Mm -hmm. you know, birthing creatures from the earth to be his army, you know, like it's, that's scary. That's like inherently scary. right? And I just, yeah, that's the, I, I love that King, you know, he has this aura of horror around him and he is taking that and fusing it into classic fantasy. And it's, I just love the creativity of this, this whole scene. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, well said the the added and there's an added kind of element to it from like the reader perspective that granted i don't remember what it was like the first time i read it but like that like knowing that you are three chapters into a seven eight novel like forty two thousand pages um story and like getting those like scant like references to future events, um, even in like in the case where there's like some some kind of heavy handed foreshadowing um, earlier in the section, I won't go into detail about it. But also, I will say no pun intended with what I just said, uh, with it being heavy handed. But um, but like here, you get this taste of like yes, this is. This book is very, very um, poetic and it's very, um, it's very atmospheric, but like this, this Oracle just referenced a man battling heroin and, and facing like, like preparing for like robbery or whatever. And a woman on wheels, like, what does this mean? Like, where is this going to go? Um, and I think that that's that is that is kind of um, that that is kind of an apex of King's foreshadowing because um, I'm I'm like I'm not afraid to I haven't been afraid to uh, to kind of not rail against King for his foreshadowing um, uh, tendencies, but it's something that it's a trope of his that I notice, and when I notice it, it, sometimes if it's not done properly, which is is kind of kind of infrequent that it's not done properly but when it is done improperly it's something that i notice and it can kind of take me out of the story a little bit but here it's just like yeah i am i'm ready like let's let's get to let's get let's get going let's 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 do it um the oracle also references the unfound doors which is like out of like out of context and like in this bubble of the gunslinger, like what could that possibly mean? Like, it's just, it's, I I love it. I love it. Amen, brother. Yeah. Thank you. (laughs) Um, so, uh, yeah. Anything more on the Oracle? Um, Uh, I think, I think that's good. I think we covered it. Yeah. Um, the next part is when Roland comes back and, uh, Jake builds the fire and, this is like the, one of the other things about this whole section is how Jake and Roland are working together very well and how Roland is noticing and feeling that bond form between him and Jake. And this is kind of uh, this is kind of uh, reaches a pinnacle, I guess, where Jake is building the fire and he starts reciting the like little, like not limerick, but the little saying that Roland said earlier, the spark of dark, where's my sire? Do I lay me? Do I, do I stay me? Bless this camp with fire. Um, and Roland like catches that. And he's like, I don't even remember saying that in front of him. Like he got it from me. And it's just like that, that like little, that little like, uh, crack in the kind of, invisible armor of Roland where he is keeping everyone at arm's length and everything, but we're seeing the little cracks in that facade and it's, it's like the stoniness of him is, is becoming more malleable and, and accepting of, of companions and everything. And then it's followed up with him, like realizing, like thinking that, yeah, Jake is going to be in danger and he's going to be a sacrifice for the tower and everything. And, the whole, the whole, like he ceased being Jake and became the boy is just incredible writing, incredible writing. Um, I love it. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then after that we get 
pretty much to the ending where um, they're climbing the mountain, they encounter the man in black, and then uh, Roland uh, basically... Oh, oh, Roland tells Jake about uh about where he grew up and everything um he refers to it as the biblical term uh uh, canaan Uh, he doesn't say gilead which i found interesting i don't know i don't Mm -hmm. know the geography of 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 uh midworld or gilead or anything but um i don't know if that i don't know if canaan is just the name of like the barony or whatever or whatever it's the terminology is um but he talks about how there was like Jake asks if there was a war and Roland says better a revolution. Um, and then he also mentions how he is the last gunslinger and everything and all of his friends are gone. What did you make of like this scant detail about the backstory uh, as it's being slowly, slowly unfurled to us uh, by Roland talking to Jake? Um, I, I feel like, is that, is that do you know is that something that's added in for the like the unabridged version or or whatever? That's a really extended good question. Version. I I re- I don't know if it's I I don't know, but that's a really okay, good I'm question. Not sh- I'm not sure either because it 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 feels a little tacked on, um, mm-hmm. especially like if I go you know you go back to 1970 whatever when this was a, a chapter in a a science fiction magazine mm-hmm. you know I I don't know. I, I don't know if Stephen King had those grand plans back then to make this whole thing. You know, I, I just, that's a good point. I'm sure he did. I just don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, I think it's, um, it, it just, it, it's not poorly written or anything. It just feels a little tacked on and mm. a little, um, a bit of a filler maybe, um, yeah. to, to, to get him to the conflict at the end maybe, but, um, I'm not against it or anything, mm. but, uh, yeah, um, and it's interesting to think about, you know. Yeah, yeah, I think it's an interesting kind of additional piece of of backstory because we had the extended like flashback in the last chapter, so now we get a little bit more. It's just like breadcrumbs, um, and I want to say, I feel uh, I don't know if the next uh, section. I'm not sure if we get. Um, another flashback oh i I, we i do believe that the next one we the next one or the last one we get a flashback i think Mm -hmm. i can't remember yeah i can't remember because yeah i will figure it out um (laughs) in in due time um yeah yeah. any other thoughts on this section because it ends with the encounter with the man in black and the kind of ominous tone of of jake potentially you know realizing that he is not fully protected by the man who has said that he would protect him um and the man in black using that um in their interaction um any any thoughts on that or the or the ending yeah to just just a comment i had about um we talked about it before but the beauty mm. of audiobooks um, oh yes the the performative nature of them um i i I, this is my first time listening Mm -hmm. to them the the dark tower audiobooks and uh this is one of my favorite parts so far because there's a line uh in this moment where uh jake is kind of looking looking up at the gunslinger and you know he's like we could we can turn back or we don't have to go this way yeah. or something like that or uh, he I, maybe about i can't remember the exact words but um jake's scared mm-hmm. and he's like i don't really want to do this and roland robert guidall the actor the george that's, that's the, george guidall. george guidall yeah george guidall uh delivers the line as roland he just says You'll be all right. Yes. Just just the way he <laughs> says it, it like I didn't have this experience, but it made me think of like a like like a like a pushy sports dad mm. sen- sending his inexperienced eight year old kid up to the plate to take some swings against some like twelve year old pitcher who's gonna mm. smoke the shit out of him and yeah. he's scared that he's gonna get struck out or he's gonna get hitting the side of the head with the baseball and get mm. a concussion. And his dad's like, you'll be all right. Get up there. Like, that's what it made me think of. And it's not, 
Like it's not reassuring at all. Right. It's, it's just <laughs> it's just a, a a disregard essentially of of the kid's feeling. It's a but, coldness. Uh, coldness for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um. I I but like just that that delivery just like totally washed over me in that regard. And again, that that was not my experience as a kid at all. Like right. My dad was <laughs> never that cold to me. Uh, but yeah. That's just what it made me think of that stereotype Mm -hmm. um and i was just like damn that is just perfect for that moment you know absolutely Um, and and the transition you know the whole story we had been building up this this bond and it was becoming sort of a touching thing um and and we were getting attached to it and then it's literally just knifed and knifed away it's gone just like a limb that's been cut off it's gone uh, I just love that. It's it's like cruel in a beautiful way. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Yeah, th- that's my that's my thoughts on the ending. I mm-hmm. it it got me so excited to continue with this project on the podcast and keep reading this and, and doing these episodes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And we will definitely be back sooner than we were this time. Um yes. but yeah, because I I'm just so eager to continue on with this because it's just it's yeah. so damn good <laughs> and i've i've told myself i'm not i'm I'm never gonna read ahead right i will never Same. jump to the next section before we've recorded about it so right it's it's been two and a half months since i read this right? uh yeah so <laughs> yeah oh yeah um yeah so uh yeah i that's it for um uh, for the Oracle in the mountains, any, any final thoughts on this or should we kind of close up shop a little bit tonight? Uh, I'm, I'm done. I'm ready to, uh, move on to the next one. Nice. Same here. And that next one will be, uh, chapter four, the slow mutants, uh, which was published in the magazine of science of fiction of fantasy and science fiction in July of 1981. Uh, so we will be back soon with that. Um, once again, I just want to pitch Patreon to you guys, uh, patreon.com slash obsessive viewer. We have a ton, ton, ton of stuff there, uh, including weekly, uh, review, read along reviews of Stephen King's stuff. I have a whole backlog of most, most of Stephen King's short fiction collections are covered. Each story is covered, um, individually, in 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 that and then also i have immediate reaction recordings for tv and movies book reactions all of that uh all wrapped up into that so check that out patreon.com slash obsessive viewer um yeah uh any any final thoughts tiny (laughs) i think Um, i said that before (laughs) well i'm just i'm glad we finally got to it same here and we will be back soon with chapter four um yeah, I'm going to start playing us out. Uh, I do want to say that uh, I realized last time on the podcast when we had Kim C on, I forgot our sign out. Uh, so uh, we're going to make sure that we don't forget the sign out this time around. So uh, yeah, check out uh, our other shows. Obsessive Viewer Anthology is coming back soon to cover Black Mirror and Twilight Zone. Uh, but yeah, but thank you guys so much for listening. Long days and pleasant nights. And may you have twice the number. And now, enjoy this short clip from our Patreon-exclusive RSS feed. For the full clip and more exclusive Patreon content, such as early access to episodes, TV book and movie reviews and reaction recordings, commentary tracks, and Patreon poopery episodes, go to patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer and become a patron at the minimum rate of $1 per month. Thank you and enjoy. As far as podcasts go... I found a new one. Paige read about it in mm. Indianapolis Magazine, Indianapolis Monthly Magazine. Oh. Um, Is it called The Obsessive Viewer? <laughs> hey, <laughs> we done been in there years yeah. ago, bro. Were we? If if only. No. Oh, yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> Not so much. <laughs> um, no, but this the podcast is called It's Problematic. Mm. And what it is is two uh, researchers, maybe, for Connor Prairie here in Fishers, Indiana. Okay. Um, basically, they are uh, re-examining the whole William Connor story um, because, basically, for those who don't know, Connor Prairie is like a 
living museum, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. Like it's a, uh, you know, you go there and there's people acting like it's 1836 and stuff like that. And um, it's on, it's in Fishers, Indiana, which is uh, butts up to Indianapolis on the mm-hmm. north, uh, northeast side. It's in um, my neck of the woods now. I've been wanting yes. to go there since I live close to it now, but I just haven't gotten a chance to. It's a great place. It's really cool. Um, but the the land uh, belonged to William Connor, who was a settler in the early 1800s. I, I don't really remember, like around the time Indiana became a state, like mm. 1820s or something like that. But anyways, he's, he's basically been mythicized or mythologized, and most of the stories and the myth mythos around William Connor are kind of mythic. Like they're not really mm. true per se. Like he was kind of a dick. Um, Interesting. Uh, he kind of did some terrible things and uh, to the credit of Connor Prairie, they, as they've discovered this thing and as uh, you know, societal opinions on history and our relationship to it are changing. Mm-hmm. They are decided, they decided to have these two researchers start this podcast wow. and, reveal these things and sort of attempt to change the story and the myth of William Connor. And it's freaking good, man. Like they, nice. it's amazing what they've come up with. And they had uh, this guy from, uh, they had like a professor from IU on there. They mm. had this guy who is like the Han- uh, Hamilton County. He's like the head of the Hamilton County historical society, which wow. Fishers is in Hamilton County. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, it's just amazing. It's it's amazing what they've discovered, what they've come up with, and how they how they're framing the story, and frankly, just that it ha- that it's happening. You know, because typically an institution like that would want to protect their image, I guess you could say, or you know, um, yeah, put put a, put a glossy shine on on the history, but really they're just yeah. trying to get to the get to the truth of this. Um, so yeah, one, one host is a um, uh, African American guy from Cincinnati, and mm-hmm. the other host is a a woman from Scotland. Uh, originally Very interesting. but but yeah they both work at uh connor prairie so nice. it's it's really cool it's it's fascinating i think even if you're not um if you're from indianapolis and you know what connor prairie is and you've been there i think it probably means substantially more to you but even if you're not from indianapolis it's it's kind of fascinating or if you're familiar with you know that whole living museum kind of thing or whatever uh you yeah. might be interested in and what it is so connor prairie is a cool, really awesome place though i've mm-hmm. uh my, my last company i worked there a lot um nice but uh it's it's, yeah, it's a cool place yeah so i guess i mean is that what's problematic that, that that apparently they had fire alarm systems in the 1800s did we just <laughs> right? did yeah. we just blow this whole thing wide open here <laughs> William Connor invented the fire bell. Yes. <laughs> uh but yeah, that's interesting. I just subscribed to it. It's uh this is problematic. Uh This is problematic. That's what yeah. it's called. Yeah. This podcast was edited and produced by Matt Hurt and presented by obsessiveviewer.com. You can find links to all of our shows at obsessiveviewer.com/podcasts. For exclusive bonus content, including reviews, commentaries, and B-roll episodes, you can subscribe to our Patreon at patreon.com slash obsessiveviewer. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.